We will go to our guest now. Okay, can you hear us? Hello, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear. We can hear you and we can see you. Yes, I can hear you. Thank, thank you for your patience. Perfect. I can. All right, we will uh, turn the floor over to you for a few opening remarks, and then uh, we'll open it up for questions. So, over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, greetings from uh, Sana'a here in Yemen. It's my great pleasure to brief you today on the current situation uh, in Yemen. And I would like to start by simply saying that the situation in Yemen at the moment is very bleak. At the same time, I mean, I want to say that Yemen entered into the third year of the conflict right now, and despite the tireless efforts of the Special Envoy of the Secretary General, there is really no end in sight. At the same time, it is clear that the only solution to this conflict is a political solution. So, in the meantime, the Yemeni population is enduring an incredible hardship, and I assure you, looking at it from, from up close, it is really, really heartbreaking. Yemen has been long been seen as a forgotten crisis amongst other crises that are calling for the world's attention, but as now civilian casualties of the war continue to mount, and Yemen is topping the tables as the world's largest food security crisis and the world's largest cholera outbreak. At present, the UN estimates that about 20 million Yemenis are in need of humanitarian assistance. That's about 70%, imagine, 70% of the population. The country is on the brink of a famine with 60% of people do not know where the next meal is coming from. Out of that category, in fact, 7 million people are close to slipping into a state of famine. If you look at the children, near, nearly 2 million children are at the moment, uh, we consider them acutely malnourished. Adult, and adding insult to injury, malnutrition makes, of course, children more susceptible to cholera, and at the same time, diseases create more malnutrition. So if you look at it together, it's like a deadly combination. Over the last few months, we've recorded almost 400,000 cases of cholera now, and nearly 1,900 associated deaths. We expect this cholera outbreak to continue to wreak havoc, despite the best efforts of the UN agencies and the NGOs on the ground. Humanitarians at this point in time are asked to cover gaps that are well beyond our mandates and our capacity. I just want to go into a few reasons why this is actually possible. As you probably know, historically, Yemen has been one of the poorest Arab nations, if not the poorest, with rampant poverty and corruption, poor governance and poor infrastructure. The war, I would say, has just simply made it much worse. So I want to talk a little bit about the food crisis first, and then I'll talk about the cholera. I think it should be absolutely clear that the current Yemen food security crisis is a man-made disaster, results, not only resulting from decades of poverty under investment, but also as a war tactic of economic strangulation. If you look at it from the macroeconomic point of view, of course food security has both supply and demand issues. 90% of Yemen's food is actually imported, therefore food imports are crucially important for, for food security it's, itself. At the moment, Food imports are difficult because commercial importers are few and face significant financing challenges in accessing the necessary lines of credit, problems with correspondence banks and hard currency. Foreign exchange reserves have already been depleted and the country is experiencing a liquidity crisis as well as a hard currency shortage. The distribution of food within the supply chain has also been disrupted. Uh, as you probably know, logistical capacities have been uh, severely damaged, particularly, I think, uh, particularly in the Security Council, the issue of the Hodeida port has been mentioned on, on several occasions. Commercial flights in and out of Sana'a airport have been discontinued since last year. But I think what is crucially important here is to understand that the food security crisis in Yemen is mainly driven by demand aspects. And what I mean here is increased food prices and particularly the reduction of purchasing power of the Yemenis themselves. Prior to the conflict, Yemenis were already living under the poverty line. Now, since July 2000, or September 2016, 1.2 million civil servants have not been paid, and many businesses have collapsed. So although food may be physically available in the market, it is actually financially out of reach 
for many of the poor families uh, at this point in time. If you look at the figures provided by IMF, we look at the moment of a double gap of import financing and purchasing power of about $155 million a month. And this gap is now mainly financed through an actual food uh, reduction in food consumption. And therefore, this directly contributes to the food security. I'm just moving to cholera now, just to give you an update as well. Cholera is, of course, not new to Yemen. What causes the cholera outbreak to be so huge is the collapse of the health, water, and sanitation sectors due to a lack of salaries and damaged infrastructure. For example, almost half of the health facilities are no longer functioning because they're partly or completely damaged. Doctors and nurses are not coming to work because they have not been paid and looking for income elsewhere. Garbage is piling up and water treatment plants are functioning partially because of lack of money for fuel to fuel the generators. So whilst as collectively as the UN agencies, we are, we are fighting to combat the looming famine and the cholera outbreak, the conflict continues unabated. And every day that passes, another day is lost in addressing very pressing development challenges that will impact on the future of Yemen for a long time to come. I'll just give you a few examples. Shockingly, Yemen's population of 27 million is set to double by 2050. Sana'a's water table is continued to sink to further depths. Climate change will have further negative impact on the agricultural production. The closing of schools will have a long-term effect on children's education. And of course, malnutrition will have long-term effects, including stunting and other health issues. I tend to say that I compare it to a bus full of Yemenis racing towards the edge of a cliff. Instead of hitting the brakes and turn around, the one that controls the direction of the bus keeps going and push the accelerator, all but certain to crash. The current crisis requires, of course, an unprecedented response, and the UN collectively continues to scale up, up in Sana'a and Aden and many, many regional hubs throughout the country to fight the lumen famine and the cholera outbreak. For example, UNDP, we teamed up at World Bank to preserve the capacity of key national institutions to deliver livelihood support to the poorest families through cash for work programs and to re restart key agricultural businesses such as greenhouses and repair broken infrastructure such as sewage, sewage, water reservoirs, roads and so on. As such, we also contribute to the famine and cholera response by improving the purchasing power of households and increase agricultural production and, su and support cholera prevention to deal with the sewage uh, system. Importantly, we also work as UNDP with national entities to clear landmines and other unexploded remnants of war to protect the population as well as humanitarian workers when they do their work. It is interesting to note that uh, in 2012, Yemen was about to declare itself free from landmines until the war broke out and this uh, caused us from, to basically start from scratch. So just to finish with a couple of messages, it is clear the war has to stop now. We really urge the warring parties to find a peaceful political solution to the conflict. The, the 2017 humanitarian response plan amounts to 2.1 billion. It's only 45% funded. And despite the high level pledging event that took place in Geneva in April, where for over 45 member states pledged about a billion dollars, we still require these funds to come through. We call on the international community therefore to redouble their efforts to support the people of Yemen. If we, fail to do, if we fail to do so, the catastrophe we see unfolding before our eyes will continue to claim, claim lives and will scare future generations in the country itself for many years to come. As I mentioned earlier, we really need to find a solution for the payment of salaries of civil servants, particularly in the health and education sector. The implementation of the humanitarian response plan is really based on the assumption that the minimum of state infrastructure remains operational, otherwise it will be very difficult for us to continue implementation. And finally, we also call on all the parties to facilitate humanitarian workers to, ac to give access to areas affected by the conflict. And this not only includes physical access on the ground, but also refers to other issues like visas, jet fuel, and so on that are currently hampering uh, the work of the humanitarian agencies on the ground. Just to fi finish with the saying, I think we can still stop this bus and turn it around before it goes over the edge of the cliff, but time is really running out. And it's really running out to find the brakes and stop this from happening. So thank you very much, and I'm ready for questions. Over to you. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, uh, we'll turn over your questions. Yes, Carol? 
Hi, I'm Carol Landry with Agence France Presse. Just your last comment on th on saying if there's still time to find the breaks. Can you identify what will be the one or two things that could happen uh, that could uh, have an impact on the humanitarian crisis, specifically? I think two comments, uh, two, two points on that. First, I mean, as I mentioned, I think we really need the war to stop for us to really be able to reach the population that are in need. Uh, we're facing many security issues on the ground that prevents us from accessing big parts of the country where uh, we should be delivering assistance. I think secondly, also, as I mentioned, you know, we continue to scale up, but we face many logistical hurdles when it comes to the facilitation of the work, including particularly, and I want to repeat that, the issue of visas for workers, as well as also facilitation in terms of uh, getting permits to, to, to reach uh, difficult areas. And for example, the question of jet fuel. I can give you a good example on that. At the moment, uh, we have only two flights going into Sana'a, one from Amman and from Djibouti. At the moment, there's no jet fuel available in Sana'a, and jet fuel has to be imported through uh, the port of Aden. But we have uh, difficulties obtaining uh, permission from the coalition and from the government of Yemen to transport this jet fuel to Sana'a to facilitate these flights. So these are the kind of issues we'll be facing at the moment. Yeah. The, why is the coalition denying permission if this is for humanitarian flights, the jet fuel? Yes, uh, it's a good question. I don't have a good answer for it. We keep pushing to get these clearances out uh, because it's also uh, greatly extending the cost of the humanitarian operation because now we have to fly through Djibouti to refuel and then get into into Sana'a and that, you know, on a monthly basis costs almost $120,000 extra to maintain those flights. But I don't really have a good answer to that question. Over to you. Thank you. Rosalind? Yes, Rosalind Jordan with Al Jazeera English. Thank you for the briefing. Uh, three quick questions. One, in addition to the malnutrition and the resulting uh, spread of cholera, what other major health problems are there among those who, have, who are caught in the warfare? Number two, do you believe that the Hadi government is doing enough to try to maintain the infrastructure, to try to keep civil servants at work? And if not, why not? And then finally, do you believe that this is essentially a failed state in which you are working? Thank you. Thank you. First on the health question, I mean, uh, as I alluded to, essentially the health sector has collapsed. And this is uh, to do with a couple of factors. One is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, about half of the health facilities are either uh, partly of completely destroyed, so they're no longer functioning. Um, many of the health workers have not been paid for almost uh, a year now, meaning that many of them they do not show up for work. Others, they may charge extra fees for the services that they provide, and that makes healthcare uh, unaccessible for a big part of, uh, of the population. So the, the truth is, the naked truth is, whatever disease you may have, and particularly when you're in the rural areas, it will be very difficult to receive treatment, despite the best efforts that the UN and NGO partners are, are putting forward. So when you, for example, I think the last two weeks we have now uh, on top of the cholera outbreak, there's also a meningitis outbreak. So uh, this crisis keeps stacking up from one to one, one to the other. On the issue of salaries, um, despite I think uh, assertions to the contrary, I, it's my understanding that civil service throughout the country have not seen the salary since uh, September last year which renders the provision of basic services, be it health, be it education, be it water and sanitation, uh, very difficult. And I think this is also one of the underlying reasons why cholera have broke, has broken out, because it's not only a question of the health facilities, but it is also to do with the, the sorry state of the water and health uh, sector here. Um, on the third question, uh, can you repeat this was a question on uh, whether the government, whether it's a failed state, is correct? That's correct. I think at the moment we see that uh, 
to give you this uh, kind of a description, at the moment we see that about, I think, 70% of the population is in area where there is still active combat going on. At the same time, they, they are clustered in a smaller portion of the country. So you, it's also fair to say that about 60 to 70% of the country at the moment does not see active combat, but the situation on both sides of the, of the front lines is not very different. So I think it is fair to say that across uh, the country, the situation is is uh, is, in a, is in a very difficult in a very difficult state. Uh, thank you very much. Could you tell us a little bit? I'm sorry, Edith Letterer from the Associated Press. Could you tell us a little bit more about the meningitis um, outbreak? Is it throughout the country in one area? How many cases? And also, um, what kind of contacts and uh, support do you have from the uh, Houthi government that's in Sana? You talked about the coalition government, some problems with the coalition. I wondered yes. what kind of cooperation and support you might get from the Houthi government. Yeah. yeah. I think maybe to start with the, the last part of the question, when I was talking about problems of access, um, this is across, uh, across the country, I mean for various reasons. Um, it has to do with, uh, with, for example, the provision of visas, but that's equally the case in uh, in Sanaa as part of the uh, of the de facto authorities here. So it's not only a question of uh, of the coalition. I think we have access problems on both sides. I think also the security situation in many of the southern governments is not very good due to uh, Al Qaeda activity and uh, and other uh, armed armed groups. With regard to the meningitis outbreak, outbreak, I just heard about it today. I don't really have up-to-date information uh, on that. Just I heard today that uh, several cases were, were recorded, and uh, I'll be happy to give an update later on uh, with precise numbers and precise locations. Nizar yeah. Abud, Aval Division in Lebanon. My question is regarding the use, use of starvation as a tactic. Does that include the government forces as well? On the, on the financial side, of course, the, the central bank was moved to Aden a year ago. Uh, also, we noticed that Mr. Hadi has been leasing islands to the United Arab Emirates and to other countries. Where does that revenue from leasing islands go to? And who's using, who, who's being paid for that? Mr. Wilczek Ahmed tied the salaries to uh, some arrangement with regard to Hodeida. And he said he, to be paid salaries, uh, they will have to uh, reoperate Hodeida uh, seaport, and then uh, salaries will be paid from that. Where does such suggestion does it uh, uh, augur well with the with the fighting parties? Is there any progress or advance in that uh, respect? Um, it's my understanding that that proposal has been rejected. Uh, here by the de facto authorities um, uh, for, for their own uh, reasons. I don't know exactly why, but uh, at the moment, I, I, I believe that is not, is not going forward, the proposal that was put forward by the, the, the Office of the Special Envoy. Um, I'm aware, uh, of course, that the Central Bank has been uh, moved to, to Aden. It is unclear to what extent revenues that are generated uh, in, in the southern governorates are actually uh, ending up in the, in the coffers of, of, of the bank there, and particularly also sale of uh, any residue oil and so on. It is not clear whether that ends up in Aden or whether it ends up in foreign uh, bank accounts held by, by, by the government uh, of Yemen. What, what is clear, however, is that uh, wherever that money goes is that uh, salaries up to, up to now have not been, have not been forthcoming. Matthew. Sure. Thanks a lot. Matthew Lee, Inner City Press. I wanted to, I was looking at you at the UNDP uh, Yemen website and it, see, it says, I don't know, and I'm not sure when this was put up, it said that sub offices are being set up in critical geographical areas, Aden and Sada. Is, is that true? And what, what, what can you say about the northern part of the country, Sada? And also, 
given that you're, is it your understanding, just as a UN official there, that the special envoy Ismail Old Sheikh Ahmed can he actually go to Sanaa? Is he is he still speaking to the to the Houthi Saleh side, or is is that something that he's unable to do? Thanks. All right. Uh, on the first part of the question, I mean, uh, this is not only the UNDP, but you, the UN in general. We have a number of regional hubs, and SADA is one of them. Uh, I can also mention Hudaydah, for example, IP, uh, Aden, of course, Sana, and so on. So there, are, there is a presence throughout uh, the country and also in, in, in the north. Um, when it comes to, uh, sorry, the second point was? Given the, you, you said the importance of ending the conflict, whether the UN Special Envoy is my old Sheikh Ahmed, is it your understanding that, one, that he can travel right. to Sana'a, and two, that he can speak and, or does speak with the Houthis or Saleh side? Thanks. Yes. Thank you. I mean, uh, we had a visit recently from the Special Envoy. I'm sure you're aware of that. I believe that uh, consultations are ongoing. Uh, I'm aware that uh, the Special Envoy was recently in... Uh, in uh, Cairo, Egypt. I'm not sure exactly uh, about his plans of returning, but uh, you know, you should know that the Special Envoy's office both has a presence in Amman as well as also in Sana'a. So the, the dialogue with the Houthis is also uh, ongoing. Yes, uh, Joseph Klein, Canada Free Press. Uh, the Secretary General earlier this year made a personal appeal for increased uh, member state contributions to humanitarian relief. Uh, of famine conditions in uh, four areas, including, I believe, Yemen. Uh, but since that time, uh, are you aware of any personal uh, efforts by the Secretary General um, to uh, speak with uh, Saudi Arabia or other members of the coalition to ease restrictions uh, and, and allow humanitarian aid to get in, to use their influence on uh, easing uh, you know, as you said, restrictions on visas, on the uh, availability of, of jet fuel, and other ma other matters where uh, they can help in uh, better distribution of humanitarian aid. And uh, if that hasn't happened, uh, would you consider asking the Secretary General to use his good offices personally at the highest levels with uh, Saudi Arabia and, uh, and other member states with influence over the parties to the conflict to ease the humanitarian situation. Otherwise, wouldn't the bus continue on its uh, course over the cliff? Thank you. Uh, maybe I can start off by reminding you that uh, the Secretary General was also at the April pledging conference for, for Yemen. I think uh, it is very much on his mind, although I think Stefan can be speak better for the Secretary than I do. But I think uh, also following that, uh, the, uh, the principals, the executive directors of various union agencies are working very closely together at that level in the IAC and other fora to make sure that uh, these four countries that you mentioned that have been sort of prioritized in terms of the famine response get the full, or the full uh, attention. You may also remember that we just had a visit here of the executive directors of UNICEF and uh, uh, WFP and the Director General of the WHO here uh, in Yemen, they just left also to take, uh, take stock of what we've done so far in terms of the response to the famine and the cholera response and also draw, again, attention to, uh, to the situation in Yemen. Of course, when they were here, we also shared with them the difficulties we are facing here with the view to also encourage them to, to address this with uh, in their own capacities, in their interactions with, with the coalition and, and, and others. I think, as I mentioned, uh, uh, initially, we... sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, I'm just, just to follow up, um, what I'm asking is whether, in addition to the Secretary General's personal role right. in encouraging more uh, contributions, donations from member states to help alleviate the famine situation, whether he personally, it would be helpful for him personally to use his good offices uh, in direct contacts with the leaders of Saudi Arabia, other coalition members, and other parties with, uh, other countries with influence over the parties of the conflict to ease these uh, man-made barriers uh, and restrictions 
to the um, import and distribution of humanitarian aid. I mean, as much money as can be raised is fine, but if it can't be uh, uh, operationalized with, with, with relief on the ground to alleviate the suffering of the Yemeni people, and, that, and the reason for that is partly these barriers being created by the coalition and other parties, can the Secretary General personally uh, use his good offices to intervene at his level. Joe, I, I mean, I, I, if I may, I think this is a message yeah. the Secretary General has been pa has been passing on. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm just wondering if you can talk about the role of the United States in providing humanitarian aid and what the aid looks like. Um, for example, they announced a pledge of 94 million in April. Has that has that actually come through in terms of uh, tangible stuff. And also, can you say uh, uh, anything about the presence of Al-Qaeda in Yemen? How extensive is that and wh where, is, where is it concentrated? Thanks. Thank you very much. First of all, on the U.S. Uh, aid flowing to the country, it's my understanding that uh, humanitarian aid has continued to flow, particularly in terms of uh, food aid and support to UNICEF and, and WHO. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, so this is something I have to verify, but uh, I can confirm that that uh, is continued to happen. When it comes to Al-Qaeda presence, I mean, uh, it is more uh, located in the southern governorates, which is a very large swath of uh, territory. It's very ha hard to pinpoint that, uh, that down, but it, we see it more in the southern, southern governorates than in the northern, northern governorates. Uh, Masood, and then Nizar. We'll call it a day. Uh, hi, my name is Ibtisam Azim from Al Arab Al Jadid newspaper. I have three points. The first one regarding educational children, if you can say something uh, regarding schools. And the second one on visas. Can you, could you elaborate there more? Um, are we talking about aid workers? How many of them? And are they with the UN or with partner organizations? Uh, and the last point, you talked about uh, the fact that humanitarians are asked to cover tasks beyond their capacity. What do you mean exactly? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I mean, on the, uh, on the education sector, um, the concern is given the lack of salaries that uh, a lot of schools have to be closed. That's one aspect. Also, a lot of schools have been damaged in the, during the course of the war. Right now, we're facing a situation that in the new school year, is, uh, it is very uncertain it will start because teachers are, are threatening to, to strike. Also, many teachers have left the country. So really, this is uh, something that is jeopardizing uh, the entire education, education system. When it comes to the visas, this is both applicable to staff of NGOs as well as also workers, uh, aid workers for the UN. In general, we see either delays or sometimes also complete denials of visas on both sides because we actually have to apply for different visas. You see, uh, Sana requires a different visa regime than, for example, if you go to, to, to Aden. So it is, uh, there's a lot of uh, red tape associated with the application of visas is really hampering hampering the the response. Sorry, the last point was the, the last point you t in your introduction. You talked about uh, that humanitarian are asked to cover tasks beyond their capacity. Our capacity yeah. What do you mean exactly? Thank you. Yes, yes. What I'm saying is that uh, despite. You know, us doing our best with the people we have on the ground, with the financial means that we have thus far, we simply not be able to cover all the needs that are in, in the country. So when we talk, for example, about the humanitarian response plan to the total amount of $2.1 billion, this is a highly prioritized uh, humanitarian response plan, and it certainly doesn't cover all the needs in the country. So this is why I was saying that, you know, the current situation is way beyond our capacities and our, and our means. Over to you. Yeah. My name is Masood Hathar. I represent the Daily Dawn newspaper of Pakistan. I'd like to uh, ask you uh, one of the follow-up questions on one of my colleagues. You had said at the outset that there's a 45% shortage of funding. 
uh, or that is over there. And the, one of the suggestions that was made that uh, shouldn't the coalition led by Saudi Arabia, which uh, basically attacked us, should be asked to pay this amount? And have you made an assessment as to how much destruction was wreaked by the Saudi coalition when they bombed, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Yemen without any, I mean, uh, that was their decision to bomb. So how do much, uh, how much damage did they do by that? And should they be allowed, should they be asked to pay for this damage that has been uh, wreaked upon the uh, people of Yemen? Thank you very much. Yes, uh, the fund funding rate uh, is as of today. Uh, we don't really have a clear uh, estimate of uh, damage by the fighting by either party because this is a continuing struggle and as I mentioned, we do not have access to, to, to big parts of, of the country so it is very hard to know. So this is also the reason why I was saying that you know the, the, the war has to stop as soon as possible so that we can get into a different phase where we can deal with many of, of the issues. Now, I think there is an understanding that given uh, the huge needs that will come once uh, peace will come to this poor country, that a lot of the financing will have to come from the GCC countries to, to help to get Yemen back on its feet. When you say the, uh, the countries, are you talking about the coalition countries, like Saudi Arabia, so that, that have the most money? Is that what you're saying? The money, the funding. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the GCC. The, I'm just uh, talking about the, the GC, GCC countries in general. Yeah. Yeah. In any conflict like this, uh, Nizar Abud again uh, from Indian Television. In any conflict like this, uh, land exit for civilians to flee the strife or to flee the death and uh, the disease are open. Is there any such thing, given that uh, the only country, or there are two countries that are adjacent to uh, Yemen, which is Oman and Saudi Arabia, is any of these two countries opening its border for refugees to flee out of the country? Thank you very much. Um, uh, it is very interesting to see that the conflict in Yemen has generated very few refugees, and is not, I believe it's not necessarily due to border areas, because the, you know these borders that, they sh that uh, Yemen shares with both Saudi Arabia and Oman are huge, and uh, it will be very hard to stop people going back, back and forth, I believe. But at, up to this point, even by boat, we have not seen large uh, streams of refugees. And on the contrary, in fact, we still, we still see refugees coming in from Somalia and from, from Ethiopia. That's very strange. How about, the, you, you mentioned that the teachers are leaving, many uh, health workers have left the country. How do they leave? Is it only through Djibouti, for example, or other uh, routes? I think mostly people leave through Saudi Arabia. Okay, thank you so much for, for taking the time and taking all the questions. Uh, we wish you all the best, and um, we look forward to having you again soon. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.